In the previous episode, we focused on the hardware, so now let's shine a light on the human side of the process as we cover the production cycle. It's important to note that each company had their own way of working, so we'll be describing the most commonly used production methods. It all started with an idea for a game. In the 80s, nothing was considered set in stone when it came to game design. Many game designers had their own vision and experimented with different concepts as the boundaries and rules were not yet defined. Their childhood memories were often a rich source of inspiration. The thrill of exploring a desolate cave, playing hide and seek, they were trying to convey that same emotion through their games, and having such a pure source of inspiration led to gameplay concepts that resonated with many players. When they felt a concept was strong enough, it was time to follow it through. The planning stage usually started by writing a game design document, which described the basic concept and premise behind the game to help pitch the idea to the management or a publisher. Tech demos and concept art also helped efforts to get a project greenlit. When the management saw enough potential in the project, it was time to start production. A lot of paperwork was required throughout the whole project, ranging from artwork to technical documents to complete stage layouts. Typically, the bigger the company, the more documentation. Visualizing ideas with pencil and paper was a quick and inexpensive way to test and communicate ideas. Game concepts were first sketched or storyboarded, and sprites were often drawn on paper before anything else. Some characters were born in the form of elaborate drawings, while others, like Mega Man, were sketched on grid paper exactly how he would appear on the NES. The cartoony drawings for manual and cover art were created afterwards in these instances. An advantage to this method is that you can directly see what works within the limited number of pixels. Nowadays it's hard to imagine, but in the 80s having a computer was pure luxury, even in a work environment. Oftentimes computers had to be shared among employees, and file formats were far from standardized. In the early days, hand-drawn graphics and levels had to be manually converted to numerical data and entered in the game program. This was extremely time-consuming, and making modifications was an even bigger frustration. Art and animation tools quickly became invaluable in the game developer's arsenal. Giving them instant feedback how their work would look on a television, plus making changes, was much less of a hassle. Sega, for example, developed a state-of-the-art system called Sega Digitizer. It allowed the artist to intuitively draw pixels on the screen using a light pen or tablet. Most companies made their own proprietary tools that could lead to a big leap over the competition. For example, in Aladdin, the animation package used made it easier for the artist to reuse tiles from other frames. This helped to squeeze a large number of animation frames from a tiny bit of graphical data. Westwood Studios built upon this principle for The Lion King, and the tool was later sold to Sega Technical Institute. The most famous example of how advancements in development tools pushed gaming forward was Donkey Kong Country, the game that sported graphics made with the latest high-end 3D software and workstations. However, 3D software was already used years before, like for the 3D cylinders of Metropolis Zone in Sonic 2. The lead designer modeled and animated the basic shape in 3D and used it as a reference for his 2D pixel art. Now let's take a closer look at what designing a level entails. Individual artists were briefed by a project lead, like game designer or director. They were handed concept work and informed of restrictions as to how many tiles or animation frames they could use for a certain job. A producer or planner would allocate a number of days to a specific task and would help to keep the project on schedule. Level art was typically the most time-consuming, so usually a mock-up was created first to present the different elements. Once the mock-up artwork was approved, the artist could break it down in small, reusable building blocks called tiles. Once the tile set was complete, it could be used to construct the actual level. The basic flow of a level was often mapped out on paper, but when it came to converting them to computer data, level editing software became an invaluable tool, allowing the designer to graphically place tiles or even tile sets. Placing enemies and objects was also done via this tool, as was adding metadata to specify walls and floors. When level art started to become more complex, simple checkered tiles were used as placeholders to quickly test and tweak the flow of levels before placing the final artwork. Once the artwork and level layout were complete, they were handed over to the programmer, usually with a couple of notes to describe how elements should be animated. 
The programmer would integrate them into the game code and add routines and interactions. They often used temporary artwork in order to test their code before the art was finalized. Various diagrams helped to visualize the general flow of a game for the programmer, while other documents communicated the ideas of a game designer on topics like character select screens, enemy stats, and so on. Most games were programmed in assembly. This is a low-level programming language, meaning that the coding is done for a specific chipset, resulting in efficient and fast program code. But it also requires a deep understanding of the console and its architecture, as the programmer directly interacts with CPU instructions and memory addresses. Chipset specifications were listed in a thick manual. This was part of the developer's kit console manufacturers handed out to their developers. It also included the necessary hardware and software to connect the development PC to the console. An interface between the two was necessary to export game code from the PC to a special RAM cartridge inside the console and then run the code on the actual hardware. When it came to testing, the programmer could add breakpoints to the code to pause the system. A debugger tool allowed them to see what was happening inside the memory at that point. It may seem like an unreadable mess, but the programmer knew exactly what parameters were stored at what memory address. All data is displayed in hexadecimal notation, a system that uses 16 glyphs as opposed to 10 glyphs. As the 90s progressed, a slow but steady switch occurred to C++, a programming language that was easier to read for a human but far less efficient. For Sonic Spinball, they chose to program the game in C++, which resulted in a lower frame rate, but also a much shorter development cycle, which meant they were able to get the game in stores before holiday season. Of course, no level is complete without a good soundtrack and sound effect to bring it to life. Most composers started traditionally by composing melodies on synthesizer and later transcribing it to computer data. Sometimes this process was done by a dedicated sound engineer, as in the case of Sonic the Hedgehog. But more often than not, the composers themselves were responsible for programming their own music. Some even going as far as writing their own audio drivers and tools to get the most out of the hardware. Here you can see an example of music data written in assembly language. Although it hardly looks like sheet music, it works in the same way. Basically each line of code defines a note and its length for a specific instrument. As with all other areas of game development, the composers had to be inventive to produce a rich soundtrack with just a handful of available channels. The number of channels indicated how many sounds could play simultaneously. Not all channels were equal, however, as some were more suitable for percussion, while others were used for melodies. Memory space and audio RAM were other limitations the composer faced, especially in the case of the Super Nintendo, a console that made use of audio samples. Most voice samples used in retro games are infamous for their low quality, largely as a result of compression and hardware limitations, but it certainly didn't help that they were often recordings of family, friends or colleagues. In fact, the voice work used in the Thunder Force games was done by a woman from their PR team. I'm by the Some companies, like Konami, set up dedicated in-house audio teams, while others mainly worked with freelancers. The involvement of directors or producers, however, varied from project to project. For example, Yuzo Koshiro revealed that he was only handed some artwork for Revenge of Shinobi. He had pretty much total creative freedom. Last but not least, testers were hired to get general feedback and aim for a bug-free experience. Although it sounds like fun, it was actually tedious work and poorly paid. In the early days, it was still considered a good entry-level job with the opportunity to work your way up. Although that quickly changed when companies were more eager to hire employees trained in a specific art. The development cycle would range from five months to a year. Game development was not a typical 9 to 5 job, as employees often worked long hours to get the project finished on time. A typical development team for 8-bit games would consist of just a handful of people. During the 16-bit era, teams quickly doubled in size as the workload increased. Team members also started to specialize themselves, but it was still not unlikely for team leads to step in and implement ideas themselves, which continued even during the PlayStation era. Symphony of the Night co-director Igarashi, for example, implemented the menu system himself, but for some reason the menu never got a proper design treatment, hence the somewhat simplistic look. Although the budgets increased, and the production processes were becoming more streamlined, game designers still had a lot of control and freedom over their project. 
there was still plenty of room to make changes or implement new ideas as the project went along. It was often a real team effort, and all members were encouraged to come up with fresh ideas. But of course, not all data ended up in the final product. Sometimes content may have been present in beta versions that were sent to the press. Screenshots of levels could be published in magazines before they were scrapped, thus becoming a subject of speculation and intrigue for fans. After the intense development cycle, the game was ready to be enjoyed by players worldwide. But how the games were marketed and sold in stores is a story for another day.